So I want to get started with um, going through what component M is um, and just defining a bit of the challenges that component M tries to um, mitigate. So I think the best way to explain it is by having the readme on the slides or on the screen, sorry. Um, so we were talking so far about how when we are developing on the REPL, we want to reload the application. We want to make sure that we clean up all the resources. How do we do that in an effective way? We saw the pyramid of that with all the widths. Um, and we wanted to make sure that if we, like, we wanted to check if we have a better way to do it. So I built this thing called component M monad, which sits at the very beginning of your application, before your application runs. And its responsibility is to build up that app that you're going to pass to the run, run radio app uh, call. Um, so what are the things that this library provides? First of all, um, guarantees cleanup of all the uh, resources you allocate, the same way resource T will do. It keeps track of initialization time for each of the components that you're uh, subscribing. So say you're having database as a component, you have web service as a component, you have Redis as a component. When you are using this API, it will tell you how much time each of those guys is taking so that you can make an idea of where is the slowness happening when you're doing reloads on your application. Um, keep track of teardown time for each of the resources. So the same way it keeps track of how much time it takes to build something up, it also keeps track of how much time it takes to take it down so that you can be aware of where the slowness is coming from. Um, when you're using, like it's a component M, it uh, implements a monad, but it also implements an applicative. When you're using the applicative interface of, of component M, it makes the assumption, a fair assumption that there's no dependencies between the things that you're calling on the, comp on the, on the applicative composition and it executes them concurrently. So for every component that you're initializing and you're composing together through applicative notation, it will create a thread for those. Uh, the same way, it will build a dependency graph on the background as you're registering the components and it guarantees that it will run, uh, it will build a topological tree of the dependencies and clean them in an dependency order way. Uh, when resources throw exceptions on initializations, you want to make sure that whatever has been allocated so far gets removed. So if you're in the middle of an initialization of your application, you subscribe to a socket and suddenly your database fails because it's not there. If you don't have a cleanup of whatever has been happening before, this next time you run it, you're going to have a bound uh, port exception, right? Uh, reports all the exceptions that happen on initialization, tear down, and runtime, and it tells you the report of how much time it takes to tear down things. And document two types by using the component M type, you immediately know what the purpose of a function is. This function is layer zero. I know it's going to be used for building something that my application is going to use. The API, it's really simple. It provides just two function or two functions to build the components. And the way it works is you have a build component underscore. The underscore means I'm not allocating any resources. I just want to, I just want to register that I'm a component. And build component without the underscore that has the same signature as bracket. You have an allocation, a deallocation, but you don't have the use uh, statement. You just have the registering of the delocation for a particular allocation, right? So here is a quick example using um, my um, SQLite, where we have a config component on inside a component M monad, and config component is just uh, going to build a component called database. This is double quoted, but because of uh, Haddock interpretation, it just links it with the resource open and the resource closing. And you return your app environment with that, and it's guaranteed that your application is going to run in an environment where if there's any failure, it's going to be cleaned up, right? 
uh, build component, build component M, um, underscore, sorry. You have two functions to run it. The first one is run component M receives a description of your application that it's going to use for tracing purposes. The thing that builds your application and then the callback. So what we're doing is getting all that pyramid of width statements and we are flushing it into one, right? We're making a monad to remove the pyramid. Uh, and, that, and everything works in IO, meaning this monad should never be used as a stack transformer. This is just for initialization and tear down of your application. Uh, that's the core difference with uh, resource D. Run component M1 is same as run component M, but it provides a um, callback with events that get notified whenever something happens. I use both. So resource D is layer two. This is layer zero. Um, and it throws a few exceptions, Com component build failed, compo component runtime failed, mapping to each of those faces. And that's pretty much it about this API. So how does it work? Let's um, try to go to the exercise number three. And for this one, I want to use uh, GACID because you would see how that works there. Oh. Boom. Okay, so we have one exception here saying that we don't have a uh, resolve plain CLI. Let's figure out what that is about. Um, it's going to go to main. Oh. OK, just got to wait for intro. Yes. This is next week. Next week. Uh, like the release, I think it's on Emacs already. I have an old version of the library in Emacs, I think. Should be released already. But I don't know what's going to take more time for me to fix it in front of you or to just wait for this. Um, so you go through the code base as, as, we, as I'm, we're waiting for this. There we go. Let's just go through the code base while that's compiling. Uh, Up, me. Okay, so let's go from the bottom up. We have uh, two functions, develop main and main. Both of them use a version of run component. Run component devel is the same as run component m, but it reloads automatically for you. It reloads the, the, the whole thing automatically for you. Um, this is a strategy that a lot of projects are using lately. This assumes that everything gets built on the uh, component and monad, so it reloads everything every time it changes. Um, for the main, we have uh, the component program, build the application, get the app, and just run the application. Right now, we're doing nothing interesting with the application. We're just returning unit. And uh, for the main, we're doing the same thing, and we're saying trace IO hello world. Um, okay, so what about build application? Build application is a component M that builds a simple app. We build the configuration, we build the logger, we build the database pool, we render the configuration, and then we return a simple app that has those guys defined. As you may notice, app db pool is undefined here. Um, that's a bug that needs to be fixed. Build logger, uh, build uh, creates uh, build log options, builds a component using the new log func. You can tell this is not with log func but with new log, like new log func. So there's no callback here, like there's no callback that you're specifying that's going to guarantee things are being cleaned up. This is allocating and it's um, specifying how you allocate and how you deallocate. New log func returns a tuple with two values. The first one is the log func and the second one is the disposal of the log func. 
So by doing second in this argument, I'm saying call the disposal, right? When I'm tearing down. Does that make sense? And I'm ignoring the second argument here because I don't need it, and I'm just returning up log func. So I already have the log func with the cleanup semantics guaranteed for me. For the people that are really experienced with asynchronous exceptions, you may, your spider senses might be tingling right now because we are allocating stuff, and there could be an asynchronous exception happening in the middle of that. All this code manages all those uh, asynchronous exceptions with masks internally. It's not a trivial code to get right. Um, I have tested it, but it may fail. So there. Um, yeah, like just keep that in mind. When you, say, when you say it's masking the exceptions? Yes, the asynchronous exceptions. Meaning, if for some reason on the initialization process where I'm creating the resource, there's an exception happening just before I register the, the allocation, that exception is going to be stopped until I register the, alloc the, the allocation. So it shows the exception Yes. It's, it's, al it's always going to be managed. Like There's no way for your cleanup operation to not be called because we are masking exceptions. Um, build log options is just an IO, parse log handle. We are just handling um, how we want to parse things. Right now, it's just returning standard out. One of the things that I would like you to help me is to make a parser on etc. to uh, parse a string that says standard out or standard error and return the right handle. Run migrations is a build component that doesn't build anything. It's just there for registering the fact that there was a database migration at the beginning. And this guy is just uh, running a migration with a pool that is passed as a parameter. Build database pool is getting values out of the configuration, parsing the connection string, as we saw before, and builds a component with a database pool, uh, uses the create Postgres SQL uh, pool to create the pool, and you have a destroy all resources to clean it up. So every time you're creating a resource, you're passing out how I'm going to clean it up, right? It's not. Like in normal behaviors, this will be, oh, I get something back. What I do with this, I don't know. It's just voider or whatever. Well, in this Postgres SQL example, not necessarily, but a lot of time happens that you receive a handle and you just discard it. Uh, and the build config, again, is another configuration that just has um, no resource allocation. It's just to register there's a configuration component. And the same thing that we have seen before. Uh, parsing the config spec of YAML and resolving all the values, and away we go. So right now it's failing with, OK, you're working now. Great. This guy, etc. resolve plain CLI. Why is that? If we go to their system, etc. Um, I think I know why. And this is something that kind of sucks from etc. And this a decision I regret. You have to specify um, cabal flags for etc. to bring all the dependencies in. Because the footprint of etc. is so big, I made CLI optional, I made YAML parsing optional, and I made extra features optional. So you have to specify all those flags to get all those dependencies in. Uh, they will be CLI. Um, extra and YAML. And once I do that um, on the terminal, uh, stack build. Um, am I missing something here? Oh, etc. of course. I'm updating as we go. Like I, some some bugs are there, so that we work on them. Um, not all of them are were intended like that, so apologies about that. Yeah, I'm sure myself and probably a lot of them start using this. Like yep, the idea is fixing all the problems and seeing them running. Okay, so what we see here is really interesting. We have a. Um, this is make uh, GAC ID. We're looking at um, 
running the application as soon as things compile. If you look at the make file and look up for dev, you would see we have a test parameter here. Make, oh, sorry, make file mode. A test parameter here. That, what that test parameter does is execute this as soon as the project is compiling correctly. So my develop main guarantees that every time it reloads, it's going to tear down everything and build it up again. So if I go to GACID, that's exactly what's happening. We're having um, the application running. It shows the configuration. And then it tells me the application was initialized. And this is how much time each of those uh, elements took to run. Right? Um, I would like to start adding, uh, well, if I, if I change this, what will happen? Uh, if I go to main and change this to uh, um, lambda-conf and save. If we go to back to the terminal and go to the very top, um, configuration file not found, application finished, meaning is this the same thing? Yeah. Um, application finished, it tells me the cleanup of all the different things that I allocated with the time it took to, to allocate. If any of them fails, there's going to be an X here, and it's going to tell me the error of why it failed. And then it's going to perform the application initialization again, and we're going to have uh, the warnings from JCID, the application, and then it should print out somewhere in here the um, all the FP comp, um, Lambda Conf, but it's not doing it. One thing I'm noticing with GAC ID is if your application runs and stays running, the standard output of the application goes I don't know where. Um, and that kind of doesn't work. Like That's one of the things that I'm saying. I'm not happy about this. Because ideally, you want to have the logging of your application there. But um, GAC ID is hijacking that and not showing anything after the fact. Question? Yeah. How is the termination of the application triggered in GCID when you're running? So you will notice that Using devil in the wrong component devil, when you're building the application, there's two things that are going to happen. It's going to return a value, and it's going to return a disposable value that is the composition of all the disposables that are there. And Every time you call the develop main function, it's going to read a state in a non-garbage collected place in memory. And it says, hey, is there something in there? It's going to say, yes. OK, so there's a teardown for that. Uh, execute it, and then replace it with this one. If you have some special variable, mutable variable set somewhere that yeah. which finalizes? Yes. So the, the library that I'm using there is called foreign store. Okay. Um, and it, it works pretty well for these kinds of use cases, right? You're not going to use that library on production. This is morely for that rubble development. No, I, I totally got the okay. Um, so yeah, like right now, let's, let's start to add failures to this thing. Um, what can we do here? We, um, I am using right now the really naive approach of just get current time and the UTC time it. You mean some of the changes the clock? Yes. Um, there's, a live, there's a function in Rio called get monotonic time that will fix that problem. I haven't gone through that yet. There's a, no, there's no ticket for that. I will create a ticket for that. That does have its own caveats, though, unfortunately. Oh, Oh. Yeah, there's. When you say break, you mean exception? Or? It will do the wrong thing. Oh, and you will not. I think it'll, it'll close time, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. This is like CPU cycles since since you first finished it. Um, if you're not doing any CPU cycles, you're not constantly. Uh, yeah. Don't use it. Time sucks, that's all. Well, like, like, 
I would I would argue you never suspend applications in production. Yeah. You do we it on development. That, that That's good to know, though. I, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so the idea is the following. Let's um, try to. Oh, here it is. Lambda, all the lambda conf. Um, the logging and the tracing are intersecting with each other, which is, I guess, okay. Um, so what I wanted to do is start. Um, working into having failures just to see how it behaves. So why don't we go and stop, if you, if you have, right now I'm running the Docker Compose database. Um, if we stop that, what will happen? Like, if we go to, say, um, LC, or it's blank, sorry, LC, and go to, I think it was two, and Docker Compose, stop. Okay, perfect. If I go there and I modify this to say, oh no, what will happen on the on the on the REPL? Uh, I was expecting it to fail. For some reason, it's connecting to a database, even though there's no port. I guess for the, for the sake of demo, I'm just going to go here and do a cheat and say Roio Oracle, who knows. And um, import control exception um, uh, error call. So I'm just doing what normally will happen if I do error. There's this error call constructor that allows me to emulate that, but I'm just gonna do it with throw IO because I think it's safer. Um, if I load this, what will happen? Why are you not reloading? Where? Yeah. What's going on? Like normally, what would happen is you have uh, an exception happening in the runner that reports you, "Hey, this uh, component fell at initialization," um, but it's not working as suspected which is rather disappointing. Oh, well, we have ONOs here as well. So probably it's this ONOs being rendered. Hello, word. If I go and do this through stack build, Do odd bin component program. Do you see the database here? Like the database. Let me try something else. So if I run this in main, as you will have it normally, it will report a component build failed with the exception that happened. And the result of how much time it took to um, deallocate everything and if there was any failure around that. This output is like that because it's using the show instance rather than the display instance. The summary that we were looking before was showing a display 
implementation of the records that this library is throwing out. Uh, if we run it with make dev GAC ID, we would see this instead, where it says an application failed, the application failed, and the following error was thrown using the throwm function, and it tells you this is the error. Following, we have the information of the application resources cleanup. So it tells me all the things that got cleaned up because of this error, right? So ideally, we want to make sure that um, whenever there's an exception going on or a teardown or setup on a REPL-driven development, those guys are cleaned up and you don't have to deal with it on the next reload, right? For some reason, the demo of throwing an exception on the component call is not doing what it's supposed to do. And I'm really sorry about that. But in theory, we are going to be using this library to build more complex applications later on. Um, why don't we go through the to-dos of this project just to make sure that we revisit the stuff that we have seen before. So um, the first to-do is get logging out of the config. Make sure you use parse log handle. Um, parse log handle is this function that is a JSON parser that receives a JSON value and returns a handle. And we have to make sure that whenever we're having a configuration value for the handle, we parse it in here. So what are the things that we need to do in order to make that happen? On our config, if we go to config spec, we have a logging entry with a handle of uh, attribute that defaults to standard out. In order for me to use this entry, what I need to change in this code. So I have the config here. And what function would I use to get plug the value out of the config? Um, so we'll do JSON from value. What is the, the function that we have been using so far? It's not this one. If we look at the documentation or previous examples to config program. Is it the dot colon? Uh, the dot colon. That's on the parser itself. So why don't we start with that? Yeah, like we have uh, the text of the value in here. So we're having a JSON parser that receives a string. And we want to make sure that we parse different string values into IO handles. So what will we do here? You need to call it C over here. Okay. So if we do get config value with, Right? Mm -hmm. And we use the parser, and then we plug the value out, logger, logging handle, and the config. We will get the value that we need, right? Um, handle. We'll just do that. So how, do, how can I make this uh, parse log handle work? I know I'm receiving a text JSON value already, and that text value is in this variable called handle text. What is this handle text going to contain? If we look at the spec, the default is string with standard out. So we know that if handle text is equals equal to standard out, then I'm going to return that. Else, yeah, like return. We can do that. But that is just saying that if it's not standard out, then it's going to be standard error. Um, that works. We could do and Worst case scenario, I like to do and 
the JSON value. Just going to be. So this is saying, if I'm not able to match any of these guys, instead of coming up with a default that maybe is not sensible, I'm just going to say JSON parser for fail with a type mismatch error and report that. Right? And this is um, this API is mostly ASINs API. They have this utility for every of the primitives. So they have a with object, with array, with boolean, and you and this, this will automatically say. If the JSON value is not what you're expecting, I'm just going to fail with that type mismatch automatically. That IO handle out argument at the beginning is the same IO handle argument that I'm putting on line 125. When it says with text, does it really mean data.txt? It means at this, at this point in time, yes, because the JSON string record on ISON uses a text as a value, right? So this handle text is actually going to be a text. Um, so, yes, exactly. Like if I do, let me experiment with that. I can do that, and then I change this to be with object. Yeah, exactly. Now you get it out with exactly with a dot column. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, like a lot of times you want to do parsing, but you don't want to go through the from JSON strategy. You can, you can easily say parse JSON here, and it will be the same thing, right? As long as the type has a from JSON instance. Most of times, though, you want to have a custom thing because those instances are probably not sensitive to JSON configuration parsing. Um, OK. So we did this to do and that to do. And probably this guy is going to fail let's, let's, if we run it. Um, add type is matched in import list. OK, so sadly, for some reason, type mismatch is not exported on data.ison, but in data.ison.types. So I like to explicitly import it so that people know that's the situation. If I go to the terminal. It's going to say, hey, my application is failing. Why? Because um, you're expecting an IO handle, but you're getting an object. Why? Because I'm in here, I'm plucking logging. I'm not plucking a uh, logging handle. As soon as I do that, it's going to fail for a different reason. But it's, it's every time it's cleaning up. Right? Um, Like if I go and go to the REPL here, and we'll have to reload it. And do main devel, um, what? Devel main, sorry. It's going to tell me the same thing. And at this point, I have an environment variable on this GACI REPL that keeps the tear down of the previous execution. So every time I do devil main, you will notice that it's cleaning up the previous one. Because the previous one failed, it's empty. But if it was a successful build, that the tear down of the previous build is going to be there and it's going to deallocate it and allocate it again. So it's replacing that box every time. And the idea is you build all the application through component M. And then you just use front component devil, and it should be the same thing if you run it on main or devil. That implementation detail is abstracted away. So let me try something. Maybe there's a bug in the library where. Um, I tested this though, that if this throws an exception, it should report it, but it's not. It's so weird. If I remove arbitrary error. No, it's the database component pool, no component database pool. 
Restore your resources. Oh, 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 of course. Duh. Sorry. Um, I'm noticing that I'm never executing raw migrations here. So, of course, it's not going to work, right? Uh, I'm only executing the database pool allocation, not the migrations. If I go and, and that was on purpose, but I forgot. Um, if I go in and run the migrations in here, uh, it needs a log func, and it needs the app db pool. Oh. What will happen there? Yeah, now it's throwing an oh no's because that's what I'm throwing away from the uh, component. It's going to tell me, hey, uh, there's a component allocation failure. The database migration component is failing with the following error. And this is all the things that I clean up after the fact. Right? Some, if you notice on this output, the build component underscore calls, they have an empty on the, on the parenthesis, meaning there's no, nothing to deallocate, ergo, there's no time. Um, if I go and remove that oh no's and actually do the migration, it's still going to fail. It's going to tell me something more useful. It's going to tell me, hey, libpq failed. I cannot, I, I don't know where this exception, like where the server is. Right? Um, and if I go and do docker compose opt d and go to this guy. I was scared for a second here. Um, hello again. Load. Now tell me, hey, it's still failing. I think I know why, but maybe, and this is an error that happened before. You notice that I'm exposing the port from the container, but I'm not specifying the host name on the DB connection string. How do we fix that? You can edit there on line, line three. You can post. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Um, do I have a host? Yeah. 99. 99? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, do I have a host on the spec? Figure it out. Nope, I don't. Okay. So, at this point, I just can say, I can do this, which is the same as saying, et cetera, spec default this. Okay. So, you can actually have like primitive values there, and it will infer the type of the value, and it will put that as a default value itself. So, if I go and I Save this again and go to the REPL. Huh. Check it out. Things are, the threading is, is a bit off. Like the, the outputting of the threads are, it's a bit off. Uh, maybe there's a sign that I should not use trace IO for this. But um, yeah, things are working. The, I don't know why it's doing, oh yeah, because of that. Database migrations is there, and it took uh, 20 million seconds. Um, any questions so far? <laughs> sure. So, yes. On the demo main line one seventy three, there's a actually on line one seventy six there's a display of three and one sixty nine. Um, yes. My intero is throwing some no instance for display. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you do get some module updating it? Yeah. Hmm. Have you try to shut it down and turn it off again, <laughs> just in case? <laughs> IT crowd the hell out of this. Okay, so I have a challenge. Can we get the code base from two and transform it into components? Why don't we give it 15 minutes to do it and uh, figure it out what are the gotchas there? Pardon? It's the only source for exercise tools in the app folder. Sorry, I don't understand. And the source for actually two that's only the app folder, is that correct? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's a minimal file. Um, so you can have everything in that same file. Um, I would say, just a spoiler alert, the number three is the solution of that exercise. If you want to exercise memory, try to do it without reading three. If you're struggling, read three. But uh, yeah, uh, let's give it uh, 15 minutes. So exercise two is the config program? Yep. The config program, make it with components. You notice that the config program has a database as well. Um, again, project three is project two with components. Yeah. Make two, the evolution of two to three yourself, and exercise it. Yeah. Yeah, so I restarted it, and hmm. I can exercise it off where it's like, there's some mismatch between. No instance display for component event. Ah, it's weird, because that, hap that should happen when you have an older version of component M. Okay. Um, component M previous versions didn't have that, so I don't know why it's picking the wrong version. It should pick the right version because we are specifying all of that on the stack, the YAML. So if we go to the projects, um, where is the stack YAML? There it is. You notice that we are adding extra depths here for 0 0.0.2. Mm -hmm. um, if we go to 0 0.0.2, Package. Uh, that has a lot of package. Do you stackage much, or is it, um, is it different than hackage? It's uh, ha stackage is the same as hackage. It's just that it's curated. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't have as much readme stuff. Yeah, I'll, I prefer I prefer this output better. I yeah. can, stackage. What guarantees you is that you will see the documentation of the package that is on that snapshot. Okay. Yeah. Right? That LTS. This is just latest. Okay. Um, and if we go to the types in here you would see that there should be a display somewhere in here. Okay. Uh, for tear down result, build result, component event. So that instance wasn't there before. And the error that it's being reported is because that instance is not there. So I'm Do wondering- Do you know how Intero, like it seems to have this mismatch between what's going on with, like, like it doesn't know, know if about if stack. I run stack repl, I don't, yeah. I'm not using, I haven't got my editor set up yeah. very well. If I run stack repl, I get the error. If I run stack build, I don't get an error. Yeah. I it know. doesn't make any sense. To for the same know, one? For exactly the same. Yeah. I don't know how VS Code interacts with intro. Oh, VS Code Com looks at your global stack. Yeah. Ah. So if it's not the same. Uh, oh, that's awful. Projects, then that's is awful. To, is there a way to change that in the config? <laughs> that face. Yeah, that, that's me material there. <laughs> um, it's dangerous. Yeah, like check it out. Uh, in Emacs, <laughs> check it. Come, come here for a second. I have this command called um, intro target that it allows me to specify what are the things that I want to load mm. on the stack REPL environment. Yeah, right. Is that is that sitting? Uh, where's that sitting? Intro that, target. That's so basically. Tar 
Stack is it's, a, it's in your Emacs. It's in my Emacs config, yeah. Like Stack has this thing called ID targets. And it shows you all the different targets that the project can compile. So when I mark one of those, what it's saying is add those disguise to the compilation of the REPL. Like okay. don't use the library, use yeah. use it as if I was developing on them right now. Okay. Um, I have the impression that that component um, dependency is not in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of unfortunate. Yeah, the fact no, that, that explains a lot because I'm I'm in a project and it's like clearly not not the same. It's some global thing. Well, yes, yeah. I, say, yeah. Yeah. I think I said GS Code uses your global stack YAML. That's not not in general, not for your not defined dependencies of your project, just for Intero. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Kind of blows. So I try typing stuff. Yeah. 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 Stack yeah. stack repl should work. Now if you do, and if you do stack build, and then stack exec component, hyphen quote. So, no. Yeah, stack. Stack exec uh, component, hyphen Okay, I'm gonna grab some water and be back. Just So why why would stack REPL for getting any kind of editor yeah. or into or anything? Why would stack REPL stack REPL break the and stack build does not break? Here. Is your stack REPL not? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what is the like? You, if you what does stack REPL do? do? Nuke Nuke stack work. Nuke stack work right now. Like in this in okay. this folder, nuke it and start from scratch. That's so weird. It's like, hey, Michael, we have an issue here. <laughs> Michael. Michael Snowman. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we just got, he took his class the last two days. Ah, uh, how was that? Yeah. It was really good. fun, yeah. Yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a good, uh, yeah. Ah, oh, he explains the stuff really well. I like, I like pragmatism. Yes, he is uh, definitely a pragmatist. Uh, yeah, blew away. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Um, and the stack build works. That's the bit that is like. Yeah. That's why would they? Why, why would they be using different? Um, they must be using some different. Different file. resolvers. 
Yeah, I think that's a question for Michael. Okay. What's the, um, how is this devil main ever getting, in what context is that being run? And how, how do we know? If you notice the make file, um, oh. the dev, like a make dev file. Oh. And in your REPL, yeah. yeah. In the REPL, would it be, it will be uh, just call that function on the REPL. Oh, so it's, it's doing this stack that component, all of this stuff, yeah. and then running that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. After, every, after every change, it compiles things, type checks, run that. And this is, is just, the, de the development version is just spitting out more stuff to the console? Or what? A few things. It's doing that but it's also keeping a state of the theory. Like, it allocates a memory that is not garbage collected ever on the REPL and puts there the teardown of the application. Okay. So as soon as it reloads it, it checks it out. It's there, call it, tears down everything, put this new one that I just created. Okay, and that's to do with, like, you can have the REPL just continuously running and, and not have to worry about this stale database connections that you know, the port being used to, that's the whole point of that's the whole point like the fact that you don't have to worry about the feedback loop breaking because yeah. of the allocated resources yeah. you, you don't have to like do all this manual cleanup and then go back into it exactly yeah. okay. and also say you're not having a bound port error mm -hmm. but you're allocating shit mm -hmm. and every time that reloads happen there's new shit being yeah. included in with the deallocation process, you make sure that the memory stays down. Okay. And the REPL development, it's achievable. When did you decide that you needed to write that library? A year ago. Yeah, you were like, we need to, we need to shorten the feedback loop and uh, make the developer experience in Haskell a little bit better. Closure, it's just the whole inspiration here. Yeah. Is it, was it a beast of a library or was it relative, was it kind of a simple like shim of sorts? Not simple, but like... It had four different iterations, yeah. from really complex to not that complex. Yeah. I wanted to initially have something that allows you to define the graph via types mm -hmm. and create it dynamically and everything. That was deemed too complex. Yeah. Um, the implementation, um, I would say it's not that complex. It's the trickiness of the exception handling okay because as soon as you're starting to play with the allocation the allocation of things async exceptions play a huge role mm. that's why you have the wits the wits guarantees that the exceptions don't okay. messed up with that guarantee and uh, you gotta compose those um, into one um, there's a project this library depends on that is called teardown which is the first iteration of this idea where it guarantees that um, teardowns compose uh, item importantly. Mm -hmm. Because like the, the idea is, I have a bunch of IO subroutines that I compose through um, arrow, like um, Chevron, Chevron. And boom, there you go, you have your cleanup, right? Like say, close database, that returns the IO unit. I compose that IO unit with close, I don't know, whatever. Boom, 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 boom. I get that value out, call it, and everything is closed. Mm -hmm. If you do that, if there's an exception happening in one of them, mm, the whole thing breaks. The, thi the whole thing breaks. If you call that more than once, mm. you have a. You already allocated that. Yeah, it's, it breaks. It's guaranteed break. Um, tear down, wraps that IO, and guarantees item potent mm. nature. And it also guarantees that uh, if that exception happening there, it won't stop the call. It will re it will register it, and it will show you a result a result a tear down result that it tells you hey, this guy failed, and this is the exception. I continue with the rest in an optimistic basis because sometimes one resource depends on another. Um, and you, if, if this, say, the, the one that fails is the one that you depend on, you're going to fail as well, right? Mm -hmm. So that could happen, but it mitigates the propagation of errors of no, I'm not cleaning anything at all because of one of them failing. Mm. And all of this has no benefit whatsoever in production. None. Oh, so you don't actually use... Well, like, you use this library, and it cleans up everything, but you don't have to. You just kill the process, and everything is gone, right? Yeah. Like, and, and that's why it wasn't a problem before. 
But if you want to increase the feedback loop yeah. in development, in development you got to have something like this. Okay. So do you, do you just keep it in, kind of keep it in there even for the production mode? Yeah, you keep the, the allocation. Yeah. And if there's an exception being thrown, it just calls it. The run component name at the top yeah. level? Yeah. Okay. And the, the idea of having this too is that this guy doesn't have the whole magic that this guy has, mm. but you use the same API, okay. right? It's for free. And this is for logging purposes? Yeah, that's for logging purposes. Yeah. That tells you, hey, this is application running. Well, I have to, uh, I have to figure out yeah, like, why the hell I will ask, that's horrible. I will ask uh, Snowman, I'm pretty sure he will have seen that because he runs support of Stack. I personally not a stack savvy. Like I know how to use it. I don't know how to debug it or where that code is being. Like what piece of code is executing that? Is that an FP complete thing or is that a? It's like, an FP complete. Michael, no, it's FP complete. Yeah. It's a it's a project that used to be from a client. We found it. They found it was useful for everyone. Yeah. And we got, like flush it out. Nice. Okay.